If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 is where we'll be and where we will stay as we continue our Sunday night, I guess, series looking at some of the questions that Jesus asked during his earthly uh, ministry. We'll get to our question in a moment, uh, but as I prepared, I was remembering this week that <clears throat> one of the favorite books of my daughter when she was very young was a book called Opposites, and it was a board book, which is, I think most of you know what a board book is. I didn't know until about six years ago, but uh, a board book, and it just had seven or eight openings in that book, and it was real cute, and it kind of was three-dimensional, had some, some cutouts, but the point of the book was to explain and, you know, demonstrate, define for children what opposites are, and it did that in a very playful way. I enjoyed reading that book. I can remember uh, reading it to her many, many times at night to the point that, as, as with so many of those children's books, uh, it became memorized by not only myself, but by my daughter, who wasn't able to read, but we said it so many times together. And for example, you turn to one page and there would be this little animal who climbed up on a ladder and on the opposite page there would be the same little animal but he was down in a deep hole and the, the only words on the page would say high and low, uh, no and, high, low. And then I would say, just because my ad lib skills, opposites. And Maley thought that was great. And then you turn to another page and there would be a little animal inside of a house and it'd have like a, you know, a, a paned window and it would say inside. And then there would be the same little animal in the same shape window but it was, you know, in the middle of snow and, and snowy covered trees and it would say outside and then we would say inside, outside and I would say opposites. There would be a, a daytime and a nighttime, there would be a white and a black, there would be a... a an empty and a full or a full and an empty and we understand the point of that book I always enjoyed reading that book I thumbed through it this afternoon just to make sure I knew what I was talking about uh, but again it's to teach children what it means to be opposite two things that are opposed to each other but that's kind of a cheater definition but but two things that are counter to each other or two things that are vastly different from one another and in Mark chapter 10 Jesus asks a question and truly, he asks the same question uh, at two different times to two different groups of people who are in two different situations or, or phases of life and who provide two dramatically different answers. And what is revealed, uh, what their answers reveal, I think, are spiritual opposites. In Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 33, Jesus explains to his 12 disciples who are there with him uh, what is about to happen to him, what's going to happen to him very soon, how he's going to suffer. In Mark chapter 10 and beginning in verse 33, Jesus saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. That's a pretty heavy statement, right? If you are a disciple of Jesus, if you're following this man and you're seeing the incredible things he can do and you're excited about all of that and excited about what might be coming next, you know, what more is there? Uh, when are we taking over this place? And then he tells you this. He tells you uh, the horrors that are to come. Uh, that might, you know, sober you up. It might bring you down a little bit. But notice what happens next. Verse 35. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. They basically come to Jesus right after he makes this statement. I don't know how much time actually passed, but the next thing recorded is they come to Jesus and they say, Look, Jesus, we need you to do us a favor. Or, no matter what we're about to ask you, I want you to go ahead and agree that you're okay with it. Which is really a, a terrible way to approach something like that. It's when someone says, hey, can you do me a favor? And you, you want to say, well, it kind of depends on what the favor is. Or, or worse, when they say, hey, what are you doing next Saturday? Well, that really matters what you're about to ask me, right? But they come to him and they say, we need you to do us a favor or we have a question for you, Jesus. In verse 36, Jesus responds with our question for tonight when he says, what do you want me to do for you? 
And again, with all of the questions that we've studied, with every question that Jesus has ever asked, he already knows the answer. He knows what they're going to say. Before they even asked him, before James and John approached Jesus, he knew their question was coming. He knows what they're thinking. He knows their motivation. He knows the plans that these men have. He knows what is most important to them, what is deepest within their hearts. And his response is, what do you want me to do for you? In my mind, and I, I, I hope this is respectful, uh, this is almost that genie in the bottle moment or the genie coming out of the bottle moment. Uh, we've all seen it in a movie or read it in some fairy tale where these explorers are in some dusty, dark cave and they find this old oil lamp and one of them, you know, just trying to find an inscription begins rubbing on the bottle and takes some, you know, the, 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 the tail of his shirt and begins rubbing on that, uh, that lamp and, and then all of a sudden smoke begins to appear and then before their very eyes there is this genie who grants them three wishes. And those movies seem to always unfold in the same way that that first wish you know is something very materialistic right it's what we would all immediately think we wanted but they realize you know that that was a mistake and the second wish is a mistake you know they accidentally utter the words I wish and then whatever comes next is what they get and and hilarity ensues and then the third wish is where they finally learn this this moral lesson and everything is heartwarming and wonderful make no mistake this is not a fairy tale. This is real. What, what takes place actually happened. These men are standing in the very presence of God. They have God's attention. And he asks them, what do you want me to do for you? They have this moment in time, all of the attention, to tell Jesus exactly what it is they want. What is their greatest desire? What is their most pressing or greatest need? What is most important to them in this very moment? And in my mind, they could not have uh, chosen their words carefully enough. They could not have spent enough time trying to figure out exactly what they should say. Or they could not have been too cautious with the words that they're about to speak. If they understood the scenario that's playing out, if they understood who was in their presence and what was about to take place, I can only imagine what they would have asked for. But look at verse 37. They said to him, Grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left, in your glory. They tell Jesus, here's what we want. Let us both have a position and a place of authority when you are glorified. When your kingdom finally comes, let us have authority. Let one of us be on your left hand. Let one of us be on your right hand. When you finally sit on your throne, we want others to serve us like they serve you. We want a better position than these other men who have been following you like we have. And we see that in another gospel account, that there is this contention between the disciples after this question is asked. We want more authority. We want more prestige than anyone else. Jesus goes on in the, in the following verses to explain that, that truly they don't understand what they're asking. And we know they don't understand what they're asking. They don't know what is about to take place. They, they've given up a lot. They've left their families behind. They've left their, their work behind. All of that to follow Jesus. But they cannot imagine that a man like Jesus who has the power of God in his hands, who has the power of God in the words that he speaks... They cannot imagine that Jesus could be put to death by anyone. That's not what they're expecting to happen. They know that Jesus has the power over both life and death, and they truly don't understand what they're asking. But it still reveal, reveals exactly what it is they want. It is what they are most concerned about in that moment of time. Now, if we continue through the chapter... We come to the end of the chapter and we see that Jesus asks this question once again. This time he's leaving the city and the crowds of people and the text tells us the disciples are all around him. And in chapter 10 and verse 46, the text says when they, they came to Jericho and as he, that's Jesus, was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus, the Nazarene, 
he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and he said, call him here. And so they called the blind man saying to him, take courage, stand up. He's calling you. Here they are leaving the city, and here is this beggar on the side of the road. The text tells us that he hears that Jesus is passing by, and he decides that his, this is his moment. He begins crying out, Jesus, Son of David. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And, and that description, Son of David, tells us that he, he believes this is the Messiah, that Jesus is the one that will fill that messianic role, just like we know the disciples did. This man continues to cry out and, and plead from the side of the road. He hasn't even gotten up through the crowds. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. To the point that the crowds are telling him, shut up, be quiet. We're trying to hear what he has to say. Or he doesn't have time for you. Just keep your mouth shut. But eventually, we see that Jesus calls through the crowd for the man to come. Look at verse 50. Throwing aside his cloak. He jumped up, he came to Jesus, and answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? Now don't you think it's interesting that the exact same question is asked of these two different parties in the exact same chapter, and really in my text only 15 verses apart. Is that not interesting? Is that means something? To me, I find it very interesting. It's almost as if God is trying to teach us something or point something out. Or if it's as if God is, or Jesus was trying to teach those disciples something or make something abundantly clear to them. Just like those 12 disciples, or more specifically James and John, I think this is that genie in the bottle moment all over again. This is the blind man's opportunity. This blind man, this beggar by the side of the road, is now standing before God and he has a chance to ask Jesus for whatever is most important to him. Whatever is his greatest need or, or his deepest concern. Look at verse 51 again. And answering him, Jesus says, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. If I was reading the book, I would say opposites. Two completely different reactions. All this man says is, I just want to see. I just want my vision back. I, I don't want to be a blind beggar on the side of the road any longer. I want my life to be better. I want, and he cried out over and over again, all I want is your mercy. Have mercy on me, son of David. There are two very different answers to the exact same question. The disciples are imagining and they are planning and they are plotting this wonderful future that they are going to have. The disciples want power, and they want authority, and they want others to look up to them, and they want uh, the, the crowds of people to submit to their authority. Bartimaeus just wants to see. Bartimaeus wants to be well. He's not asking for the kingdom. He's simply asking for his sight. Opposites. Two different approaches to the very same Jesus. The disciples say, we need you to do something for us. And Bartimaeus says, have mercy on me. And once he says that, he can't be stopped. All he can do is cry out. And all he can do is beg for an ounce of mercy from the Lord. Again, opposites. There are two very different mindsets that play into uh, these events. The disciples are, are filled with hope. They are overflowing with confidence as they stand before Jesus. And it's remarkable because Jesus had just told them that he's going to be arrested. That he's going to be condemned and handed over to the Gentiles. That he's going to be mocked and that he's going to be spit upon and scourged and even killed. To give those disciples the benefit of the doubt, it's true that Jesus said he would rise again. But then they immediately said... We want you to do for us whatever it is we ask. Almost as if someone's you know, leaving a job. Before you go, I need one more thing. Uh, it, it's, it's cold in their approach. And then there's Bartimaeus the beggar. He's not demanding. He's not expecting. He's begging. He's a blind man who sits by the side of the road. He has no hope. He has 
no confidence. He's begging for his daily needs. Maybe what he hopes for most is that Jesus would simply walk by and that Jesus would eventually one day in his dreams have mercy upon him. Again, opposites. We see in Mark chapter 10, in these two very different encounters, the spiritual opposites of pride and humility. Those disciples had grown so accustomed and comfortable with Jesus and being in the presence of Jesus and and seeing the power of Jesus on display that they are filled and even overflowing with pride. It wasn't that long ago that James and John, the, the two brothers who are mentioned specifically, were on their father's boat just mending nets. And then Jesus calls them and they began to follow him. And now they are expecting and maybe even demanding a position of authority in his kingdom. That is pride. That is an elevated sense of self-importance. They believe that they are better. They believe that that they are more important and more deserving than they truly are. And, And they don't yet understand, or what they don't understand, is there is not an inch of room in that kingdom for pride. They think that's how you make it to the top. You know, standing up for yourselves, finding that moment to approach Jesus and demanding a position of authority. In Bartimaeus, we see what is the opposite of pride. We see a great measure of humility. We don't know about his past, and we don't know uh, how he lost his sight. We don't know how, for how long he had sat by that road. We don't know how many people have passed by. We don't know uh, how he knew who Jesus was or how he came to believe that Jesus was, in fact, as he describes, the son of David or the Messiah. But we do know that he knew that in this precious moment, when Jesus, or when he answered Jesus' question, when he revealed what was most important, most valuable to him, that he didn't have any visions of grandeur. There was no pride in his request. All he wanted was to be healed. He had the humility that those disciples so desperately lacked. The text doesn't tell us But I wonder, and I I assume that it's true, the text kind of tells us if James and John were standing right there, were in the mix of all of this. uh, Did James and John hear these events unfold? We know that as Jesus left the city, uh, he was with his disciples, so I imagine they were there, and I imagine they saw all of this and heard all of this. I, I imagine that they heard the man crying out, Son of David, have mercy on me over and over. And maybe it was James and John who who were the ones who began to rebuke the man or, or participated in that rebuke, telling him, just keep your mouth shut. Maybe James and John feel sort of like the gatekeepers to Jesus. After all, they're his inner circle. They're the ones who expect to be on his left hand and his right. And this is Jesus. This is the Messiah. He's the one that's going to sit on the throne of David. Maybe they felt, you know, if you want a moment with Jesus, get in line, beggar. Get in line, blind man. Why don't you just stay by the side of the road? I think it's safe to say that 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 was probably their attitude. And we can see that again in this very same chapter. If we back up to Mark chapter 10 and verse 13, we're familiar with the text. but, But here people are bringing children to Jesus. They were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. And what the disciples do basically is say, look, he doesn't have time for kids. This is Jesus, the Nazarene. This is the Messiah. He doesn't have time for you. Do you have any idea who this is? In the very next verse, we see that Jesus then rebukes his disciples in verse 14. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and he said to them, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And it is as if Jesus took that moment and thought, I got to teach these guys a lesson. And then he tells them how bad things are going to become. And they demand this position of authority and thinks, I've really got to teach these guys a lesson. And then here is this blind beggar on the side of the road crying out for mercy from God. And Jesus knows this is my moment to teach these disciples a lesson. The difference between the children and the disciples. The difference between Bartimaeus and the disciples is the difference between humility and pride. And again, 
opposites. The kingdom of heaven, the church that you and I are a part of, is not and never will be a place of pride. As Christians, it may become easy for us to gain some exaggerated level of self-importance, or it may become easy for us to begin to think that we are better than we are, or more deserving than we are, or more self-reliant, or you know, self-supported than we are. But that sort of pride will prevent us from approaching God in the right way. It will prevent us from asking God the right questions. That pride will prevent us from recognizing in the most critical moments of our lives what is most important and what is most valuable. The kingdom of heaven, the church that we're a part of, is and will always be, for eternity, in fact, a place of humility. A place uh, that is filled with those who understand their position. Who understand and never question their great need for God, who understand how blessed they are simply by the love of God. And that humility, I think, is what enables us to approach God in the right way and to ask God the right questions and to recognize, even in those most critical moments, what is most important and what is truly most valuable. Pride is clearly the opposite of humility. And pride only stands in our way of being a faithful Christian Pride stands in our way of receiving all of the benefits of the love of God. Pride stands in our way of being welcomed into that eternal and heavenly home. There were also two different responses by Jesus himself. When he asked the question of these two different parties, both parties answered in completely different ways, but then Jesus responded in two different ways as well. When the disciples pridefully asked, look, we need to know that you're going to answer our question in the affirmative. We need you to do what we are about to ask you to do. Jesus says, you don't have any idea what you're asking. You are clueless. You are way out in left field. When Bartimaeus humbly asks Jesus, let me see if I have my verse here. I might have messed up. Verse 52 Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight, and he began following him on the road. Pride will stand between us and God. Humility will enable us to receive God's mercy. I wonder tonight, if you and I had one of these moments, how is it that we would approach Jesus? Boldness and confidence and pride or humility, pleading with God for mercy. If you and I had God's full attention tonight, what exactly is it that we would ask for? Just give me my sight, or give me authority, give me power. Would you and I be more like the disciples, looking for some reward, or or looking for some blessings, as if somehow we had earned those, or, or, or we deserved those, or would we be like Bartimaeus, simply crying out for mercy? You and I do have that opportunity tonight. If you have never obeyed the gospel, you have the opportunity tonight to to cry out for the Lord's mercy, to fall down at his feet, to obey his commands, and to put Christ on in baptism. The Bible teaches that if a person hears the word of God and they believe it, if they are willing to obey it, repenting of sin in their life and confessing the name of Jesus before men, that person can go down into the waters of baptism and have their sins washed away. If you've not been baptized, we'd invite you to make that decision. Maybe you have been baptized, but you have sin in your life. Maybe you've been a Christian for decades and you've carried that burden of sin with you. We would invite you to repent of that sin. Make it right. Pray to God for forgiveness. Let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Whatever your need might be tonight, if it's something completely else, uh, we would love the opportunity to pray with you. Uh, Make it known. Come forward now while we stand and while we sing this invitation song.